All right, okay. so my name is James Daly, and I'm moderating this panel, which is about FINERAC for regulated credit unions, SOCOs, and the like, abbreviated as uh, just for credit unions, but we will actually speak about other kinds of um, kinds of institutions. So uh, I think you all know who I am. Um, Art uh, is a team lead at Impact Makers and brings over a decade of experience in banking. And I believe we will be hearing about his new efforts to use FINERAC in launching a new credit union focused solution. Um, Luisa uh, has been um, vice president of market entry at Quelap, where uh, she's been in charge of working on just in incredible uh, projects. Um, and she's been involved in the MIFOS initiative for a, a long time. She has a background in, in uh, law uh, and uh, has been involved in Latin American startups. Uh, and, and Luisa, you can go ahead and introduce yourself better than that. I, I was just trying to paraphrase what, what was in this intro here. Um, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and Rupesh is an IT consultant with broad uh, technical background. Um, and sits on some company boards and IT departments. Uh, and I think we'll be hearing about some of his efforts in applying FINERAC to the, they're, they're called housing, um, what are they called? Well, he's going to tell us what they're called in the UK as well as yes. other places around the world. So sure. um, <laughs> let's, let's jump right into it. Um, I think maybe... Let's have um, let let's have Rupesh maybe uh, kick us off with maybe a little better explanation of who he is and and what he's been working on uh, at a at a high level. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rupesh Rakindalia. I'm based here in the United Kingdom. Um, I've been involved with Finerac for about three or four years, uh, mainly around the MyPos um, solution. I ran um, card programs for various banks. I've done, uh, been around the insurance industry for, for a very long time in, in the capacity of an IT consultant. Um, more recently, I've been looking at using Finerite and MyPOS within the regulated credit union space in the United Kingdom. And also an opportunity came up my way about three months ago to use uh, MyPOS in an indigenous national bank up in British Columbia. Um, which has just gone live about uh, three or three or four weeks ago. Um, so that's my background. That's terrific. Thank you. Um, Luisa, maybe do a, a better uh, background of why you're here and, and your intros into credit unions. Thank you. Um, so as we well, first, uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for um, Apache Finerac for having us here. Um, in the name of Quelab and myself, we are super excited to participate again at ApacheCon. And the reason why I'm here, I suppose, um, is because uh, first and foremost, I have a background in law. I am a lawyer. And um, the first... Um, I mean, the first time that I worked with regulators in um, the financial institutions um, industry actually was with Javier Burkenstein, with Borki. Um, and we um, founded a startup in Uruguay um, and we became actually the first startup in Latin America to have a, a, a central bank license. Um, and that is very important. And I think that that um, has led me to then work with multiple financial cooperatives all around the world, not only in Latin America, but also in Southeast Asia and in Africa. Um, and it's been great to see how um, Finer Act and the other efforts that, that as a community we are building, it can also work for um, regulated institutions, which every day are more and more. Terrific, terrific. And Arthur, I believe you're probably the newest person to this uh, Finerac Mifos world. Um, tell us a little bit about your story. Absolutely. Um, yeah, my name is Art Mathura. I am sitting in Richmond, Virginia in the States. Um, I've got a background of about 13 years working in sort of like the intersection of uh, financial services and technology. Um, I worked at a bank that was the first uh, uh, large bank, <clears throat> excuse me, in the United States to go 100% into the cloud. 
Uh, and so that was part of, of my journey. And um, in, in that effort, we, we were sort of partnering with regulators because the regulatory landscape hadn't sort of like matured enough to, to be prepared for launching into the cloud. But uh, I left that bank about uh, just about two and a half years ago and then went in, into consulting and the consultant where I work, consultancy where I work, impact makers wanted to target credit unions. Uh, and upon doing some research, that's when I realized sort of like the nature of, of core banking and the, uh, how it was working today. And, and that's how I've, I stumbled upon uh, FINRAC and I've been digging in for now about two years. Uh, great. Um, so let me get to a couple of questions. I'm gonna try to direct them at one person, but happy to have other people chime in on this, on these questions. So um, I think people have this impression that all banks are regulated the same, all financial institutions are regulated the same. Uh, and I think that, you know, at a high level, you can say that there are institutions and that there are regulators and that the regulations kind of cover them, you know, broadly speaking in the same way, but there are actually some important differences in how organizations are organized legally and how they are regulated. So I'm wondering if we can just do a little bit of a, a, a quick check on this. So Rupesh, maybe you could uh, sort of add color to what's the difference between a credit union and a building association in the UK um, and what that might mean for uh, the requirements for FINRAC or, uh, you know, the solution provider? In the United Kingdom, all um, of these institutions will be regulated by the PRA um, and ultimately will report to the Bank of England in some way or form. So they will all have to go and undergo the same KYC process as AML, um, PEPS checks, or SARS checks. Um, the, the difference is the organization of those entities, i.e. are they are they community based? So, so credit unions are, are locally based and have geographic regions for where they can get their customers, but building societies are not geographically based. They are, even though they are the Coventry, really, the Coventry Building Society or the some of the London building societies, they can spread their wings a, a little bit further. Um, I on an, on another completely separate note, when it comes to the like the indigenous nations, so for example, we've been working with, uh, with an, an indigenous tribe right now. Um, they are supported by the United Nations Rights for Indigenous People, and in where they're based, um, Canada have recently um, given them their own sovereign rights. So they, as a, as a as a nation, now have their own government. They've got their own banking system, um, their own banking laws, and they can organise a bank according to their own systems. The issue with that, of course, is how do you take that and translate that into a world which is, you know, governed by the BIS and all the different main central banks. That's a separate question, but they still require the same kind of software. They still require you know, loans and uh, savings accounts and share certificates and all that kind of thing. So they're, very, they're two vastly different worlds, but roughly they are organized in, in, in pretty similar ways. Terrific. Um, Louisa, you know, given your experience um, with Quaylab um, serving credit unions and, and the like, what would you say is the are there any differences and requirements that, that you sort of get into uh, with these different entities? Um, well, I think that you have like multiple ways of seeing it. Um, one from um, the regulator perspective and then another one from the operation side of the financial institution uh, point of view. So, um, and it also depends if you are in a developed economy or if you're in a developing economy, it's very different. Um, so, to begin with, um, what I've seen that has happened over the past decade, maybe, is that um, we have this wave of new regulations coming to all the financial sector, whether you are a bank, whether you are a microfinance, a credit union, a SACO, um, a cooperative like we, we have in, in Latin America, um, even if you are a fintech, every, I mean, regulations are coming. Um, but what happens with regulators is that they see, and then that's actually something that happens with any um, regulation out there, is that they see everything as if it, if it was the same. And it's not the yes. same. It's not the same no. what a bank does. 
um, and it's not the same what a credit union does, and it has nothing to do what a fintech does. And I think that that is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing right now, how the regulator is going to understand how these institutions work, how they operate, and which kind of licenses they're going to have. And the reason behind this is because we cannot ask for the same thing to a credit union that maybe is in a village born in Cameroon, for example, which is one of the yes. institutions that we work with, and been asking them to comply um, with regulations as the same that maybe, I don't know, a Scotia bank does. And what we are finding is that most of the times the regulators are asking the same things. So that is something that we need to watch out. And then the other thing that happens in terms of the operations that these institutions do regarding the technology that they need to actually deliver those operations and execute their um, daily tasks is that the regulator also doesn't understand technology. Um, and it's and it's just fine. I mean, a regulator is not supposed to understand technology, but they are supposed to surround with people that actually understand um, technology. So what also you can find is that, for example, in terms of Finteract and all the efforts and 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 things that we are doing as a community, that you're going to find with the regulator and the and and the regulators. The first thing that he's going to say is like, "Oh my God, you're in the cloud." someone is, I mean, is the end of the world. You have like all the data of your customer in, in the cloud. Um, you have all the transactions in the cloud because yes, sure, a server in the middle of nowhere uh, that every two hours it has a power um, down. Yeah, that is safer than being on the Google cloud, for example. Um, so I think that we are finding like those things. And I think that one of the main um tasks that we need to fulfill in the future as the Apache Finera community is that we need to be uh, the interlock. Um, sorry, we need to be like kind of the middle person between the regulator and the institutions that we work with to actually help them to understand what this is about and where it is that we are going. Because if we don't provide these financial institutions as credit union SACOs and, and the other ones in Quellab, we call them to you know, generalize them financial cooperatives. Um, so if these financial cooperatives don't have the right technology, they're going to disappear. And the main problem with that is that, I mean, of course, it's going to be a hit in, in any economy. But the thing is that these institutions are, are serving the most vulnerable parts of our society. These institutions are serving people that otherwise will never, ever get financial services. And therefore, everything that comes down that, if you don't have financial services and if you're not in the um, formal economy, we know all the vulnerabilities that you may have. So I think it is a huge um, challenge that, that, that we are facing right now. And it's, again, uh, I'm going to underline that. I think that as a community, um, we have to start or, or already engage in that conversation with the regulators all around the world. Right. So Art, uh, maybe you could chime in here on, on, you know, as you see it, the evolution of these technologies and, you know, sort of going digital first um, and think Absolutely. about where, where you're trying to go with your things. And um, uh, if this is maybe respond to that or maybe it's time for you to sort of show some of your slides. Uh, yeah, maybe I can, sh maybe a little bit of both. Uh, my uh, basically, here in the states, we credit unions are are facing pressure. Like uh, from a sort of a market analysis standpoint, number one, let me sort of like level up in terms of how credit unions are are regulated here in the states. Uh, there's uh, there's credit unions and then there's banks, and credit unions primarily are uh, actually. I'm going to share my slides here. Right, this is a, a good opportunity. <laughs> I figured we were. I, I was trying to tease this up so we could go right into your slides. Yeah, that hopefully, yeah, that, that worked pretty well. Um, so this is a little bit about me. I kind of covered that. So a credit union is basically a member-owned cooperative. Um, they're they're governed by a board and maintain nonprofit status. Um, they services include but aren't limited to loans and uh, deposit accounts. Um, you know, credit unions today in the U.S. There's about ten thousand in the U.S. Most of these are in the very small category but they're all suffering from aging technology, uh, mainframe core banking, and um, the platforms upon which they were built rely 
uh, or they rely upon are have not kept up with like fintechs and big banks. I come from a big bank background where about a decade ago, heavy investment was made into like really well-defined customer back experiences. Um, and so that's kind of like the backdrop. Um, and the other is so like doing a, a further deep dive into the marketplace, long and expensive contract cycles, credit unions are, are very much locked into their current vendor uh, um, agreements. And so, so they're really uh, waiting for the right opportunity. Uh, switching costs are a big concern because like the migration of data from legacy systems and uh, capabilities uh, are a big concern. Um, and so what's happening is to, to sort of meet the, the scale requirements um, of the NCUA, which is the National Credit Union Association, bigger credit unions uh, are, are absorbing the smaller ones who can't sort of like meet the uh, uh, operational uh, uh, ratio requirements of the NCUA. And so uh, I talked to a friend who sells exclusively to uh, credit unions and she said, uh, the safe zone is like $700 million in assets and up. Uh, and that's sort of like assumed that you buy another smaller credit union and get to a billion in assets. So the, the magic number is really like a um, billion dollars in assets. But, but we're trying to leverage, uh, actually, let me go, th let me just stop here. What, uh, and I'm going to stop the slide and talk a little bit about um, what we're trying to do with Apache Finract is we'd like to, to create scaled opportunities for these uh, sort of member owned cooperatives uh, through a technology platform. You know, most of these banks think of scale in terms of like, you know, uh, our loan to deposit ratios. And that's certainly a factor, but like they're struggling with the digital experience. And so th there's a great anecdotal uh, story here where we were talking to a credit union in, in Maryland and it was a teacher's credit union, very small. Uh, and I did a quick Google search on their uh, credit union and uh, found it first page on Google, which is amazing. Actually, I wasn't, I searched for Howard County car loans and found their credit union first page of Google. Click on their uh, website, pretty well designed website. And I, I went for the apply now button and essentially, they wanted me to download a PDF and take it into a branch. Uh, and so that was like the, you know, in, in, in today's fast moving world where, you know, everybody's looking at funnel metrics, you just lost like 80% you know, um, of your audience, maybe 100% of millennials and younger. And so that's, we're trying to approach the problem from a sort of design thinking standpoint. Uh, we know that credit unions are struggling with, uh, millennials and younger and we think we think this is how we can sort of address some of the problems um anyway i, I feel like i'm i can keep going but i'll stop uh, to see no, that. I, I think that that was good color on it um uh and and thank you for that um let's go back to uh let's go back to rupesh and get a little more detail on this implementation um that you were talking about with the native um the native group the first nation group uh, so, can you describe some of the the angles on digitization and sort of digital first, or is it mostly about operational? Um, so, they, so, so they went through a, a bit of an interesting time. They they had to form um, government and then laws, um, and they went complete, completely digital with that. So all of their regulations are now um, digital. They sign off things with proper digital signatures. Um, their companies are backed by smart contracts, they're confederation companies now. Um, so when it came to their banking, they, they, they looked at the BIS and then they looked at the banking uh, acts around the world and they took the best bits out of all of them in terms of ratios, in terms of um, legislation, security, and said, right, this is now our banking act. A bank was then formed within that banking act and then we then looked at some different software solutions. I think they looked at a few open source, they looked at... Um, uh, some, some some paid ones, and when I when it came to me, I said, look, from where you are standing now, why don't you go fully API based first? Because around an API based core, you can build experiences, and there's an ecosystem behind all of that 
you know, with different plugins and different people contributing and there's paid and unpaid, different things you can add on to that platform, which as you go through your journey, you can expand on, you can develop on, you can create on, and more importantly, you can add back to that community um, and then serve other na other nations who are, who are in a similar journey. Um, and that was the real appeal, was, was the fact that it was community-based, it wasn't owned by some big American or, or British or Spanish firm, it was a it was a global it was a global business for global people. Uh, it's terrific. So really, the um, the sales pitch of of Finerac and Mifos around being a community driven um, approach was actually a, a key part of the value proposition. It it was the most important part actually. Um, the the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the technology is brilliant and great and works and it's easy to use and you know that was. That's quite close up there, but the fact that they were supported globally and it had no, it's got everything you're going to need right now, but it has the ability to be extended. All the other products to extend were, are horrifically expensive, um, require specialist knowledge, um, and, and it's hard to find. Whereas if you've got a simple Java stack, you know, anybody who knows Java or anybody who can use a REST API or can write in any one of those simple languages, you know, you can, you can extend and you can expand them. Great. Um, Luisa, maybe talk a little bit about the experience of Quailapp, uh, because you've been in market with your product for a little while. What are some of the challenges sort of further down the road, um, perhaps, and, and maybe the, the way that you see the market evolving? Um, that's a very interesting question. So, yeah, we've been with our product out there for four years now. Um, and you can see how the market has been evolving um, everywhere that we are. Um, one of the things, and, and actually Rupesh mentioned, um, is that, and, and this is something that probably all of us here know, but maybe some of the viewers don't, is that um, with this type of financial institutions, you have to go through a process. So it's not that you show up there and you say, oh, I have this amazing product is going to give you all these benefits and the credit union, it's going to be, oh, wow, yeah, I really want that. It's not the case. Um, most of the times, um, these institutions are very small. Um, they don't have IT departments, so they don't have anyone that actually understands technology. Um, most of the times, they don't have legal departments, so they don't know actually how the regulations work. Um, and at some point, they know that they need to make a change and they know um, that they need to start using digital um, um, tools, but they don't actually know what it is to go through a digital transformation process. And going through a digital transformation process doesn't mean that now you're going to use a better um, um, mobile device or that you're going to use a better software. It actually means that you will need to change uh, the fabrics and foundations of your business. And that is the first thing that these institutions um, know and that you actually need to empathize with them and, and try to make them understand. It's not only about the technology. Once you bring a platform like the one um, that we have developed or any other product that you guys may be developing and, and delivering to your customers, um, it's just not throwing that out there. To use that product, uh, they will need to change their business. They will need to change their operations. They will need to change um, the channels of communication with the customers. Probably they, they will need to change their own products um, in terms of the loans, how they disperse them, how they distribute all of that. Um, so one is, that is one of the first things that we need to understand. Before this being a digital transformation, it has to be a cultural transformation. Um, and that is the first step. Once you go over that, then we can start talking about technology and what is the best thing um, that that it will be um, the best thing that you can deliver for them. And also, again, it's not the same working in a developed economy than working in the in the developing world. And for many things, um, one of the main things is infrastructure. Not everywhere out there you have a good connection to the internet. Not everywhere you have a good connection to electricity, actually. Um, many times you find that these institutions are serving people in rural areas where you don't even have uh, highways to get there. Um, and you need to be very, very empathetic into which will be the type of um, technology that you will be delivering to them and how that is going to improve um, their business. And at the end of the day, how they are going to impact the people that they serve. Because we have to remember that this 
type of institutions, credit unions, financial co-ops, they have very, very strong missions, uh, social missions. So it's just not about making money or, or as Javier um, taught me a while ago, just buying cheap money and setting it back very expensive. It's just not, it's not that. Um, is they do have a very um, sophisticated social mission. So you have to um, understand all of that, all that package. And of course, in, 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 in this path with Quellab, um, we took some time to actually fully understand how this um, could work for them. Because again, you can bring this technology, it can be, it can, it can be sustainable, it can be cheap, it can be whatever. But at the end of the day, if they don't understand it, if they don't make a cultural change, if they don't change their business, it doesn't matter how great your technology is. They yeah, are not yeah. going to use it. Yeah, I, I think change management, particularly in existing organizations, has got to be mo one of the most incredibly complex things that we do when we try to implement new technologies. I mean, it's one thing to sort of automate what they're already doing, right? But if they really want to grow and be more relevant to their markets, they need to they need to change the products, approaches, channels, etc. Um, so those are some very good points, and I can see that that's where you know art is going. Yep, I can see that challenge is going to come, yeah. and I think Rupesh is saying, yeah, we we're there. Um, I the I want to ask about uh, you know when we think about those process changes and that role of technology in in doing that. I mean, maybe Rupesh, you could reflect on this a bit and say, you know, you've been involved in the IT sector for a long time. Like, what's the what's the feedback loop that you that you hope to see when you go out to market with these kinds of products and uh, and offers? Well the, well, the first thing that I've um, looked at is the is the actual member's experience. If you look at a member of a credit union or a member of a bank or a member of any financial institution, um, I always start from there because in some cases you've got. Uh, you know the demographic that would have that don't even own smartphones, for example, in some parts of the UK, you have they do they own them, but they probably don't know how to use them as as well. You've then got a demographic of people who've been doing a certain thing for so long now that it's in, that that is in great. So they use these in cash, for example, they go to credit union, they'll get cash out, and they'll do their business with them cash. When you go into any institution and you, and you talk about a technology change or a change, it's not just about their organization. It's also, it's also about how you communicate that with their customers and taking the customers along for the ride and getting the customers buy in. Because the last thing you want to do is to so say, okay, fine, we're going to put this fantastic system in. It does all these amazing things. But then the customers go, well, I don't even know where to start. Do I need to, do I need to download an app? Do I, you know, what do I use and how do I use it? Um, so I'm always conscious from the customer experiences point of view that you start there and then you kind of work backwards into the change, into the, into the organization, the agents and the, the management. And then, you know, like Louisa pointed out, you know, all the regulatory and legal and compliance changes that also have to be implemented because it all kind of is a bit of a circular thing. Right. Okay. So I, I think that puts a good pin on that. And we could probably spend a whole session yes. talking about user-centric design and how you put the, the customer at the center of all of your efforts. But since we're talking about regulated entities, I, I think maybe this group would also want to know, um, you know, what are the regulate? What are the regulators looking for in a? What what actually do they need to see, and who do they go to to get? approvals or or proof um i mean we have we have credit card kind of auth, you know mm -hmm. certifications and those kinds of things but yes. for core banking systems is there an international body that certifies core banking systems and do you have to have that in order to run it in your bank let me ask uh louisa yes. first yes yes <laughs> <laughs> sure. Thank you. So, no, as far as I know, there's no uh, international institution that actually will certify you that, OK, this core banking system is actually complying with all of this. Um, but, yeah, you can follow some um, international standards, of course, and, 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 and open standards. And FINER Act is one of them uh, as, as the global standard uh, for technology for financial inclusion. Um, 
but basically i think that what the regulators are looking for are safe systems that are going to protect not only um, the financial institution itself but most importantly the data of the customers and and the members of that financial institution that is the key point that the regulators are looking for right now and, and we are seeing this in every industry like um private data is like in the table in the discussion table on any industry whether it is social media whether it is advertising i mean anywhere that you go you're always accepting the terms for someone to use your data and when we are talking about financial institutions that that data is actually your financial status um and so that is like another level of getting into your data and one of the things that i don't remember if it was arthur or rupesh that mentioned is that um how binding the contracts uh, between the financial institution and the core banking company are. And we have experienced some brutal, like literally brutal um, contracts amongst these institutions and the core banking providers, where uh, the core banking provider actually becomes the owner of the data of the customers. And that is another thing that the regulator um, is looking like very, very closely, that when you get into these contracts, uh, to make absolutely sure that the, that, that the, technic, the technological company is not going to own um, in any way the data of um, the institution and um, the, the customer. So to, to sum up, I would say uh, data protection and also um, the continuity and, and reliability um, of the, the, the technology that you're providing for the financial institutions. Okay. Um, I want to go to Art because I think he's probably trying to take uh, this through some kind of process with the, what's the mechanism called that it's a entity owned by the credit union? It's kind of a nonprofit service entity. And right. they have uh, to sort of CUSO. certify. Yeah, yeah what's it well, called? It's a, called a CUSO, a credit union servicing organization. Okay. Is that what is it? Uh, it, it's basically uh, it's basically an LLC, uh, limited liability corporation, but fifty percent of the revenue has to come from credit unions to to get that distinction. Uh, but that's that's more like just your operating structural structure. The, the I wanted to address uh, a question. I mean, or or like from a regulatory standpoint, here in the states we have the FFIEC. I don't know if everybody's familiar, but they actually do provide guidance on, uh, on actually, if you don't mind, I'll share a slide. Uh, and then I'll come back to your, uh, so I, I just went through this, the FFIEC handbook, FFIEC stands for Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council. Uh, and they generally, address these categories, e-banking, information security, you'll see that the structure, the, the categories overlap generally. But they do sort of come in and look at uh, systems uh, with this kind of rigor. Typically, uh, this is for bigger banks, but if you look at the um, NCUA, the National Credit Union Association, which is the governing body for the credit unions, they just point directly to this FFIEC handbook. But um, that uh, we're, we're, the reason we're taking this approach of, of considering becoming a CUSO is we want to partner what uh, Luisa said earlier. We actually want to partner with the NCUA to help uh, with the regulatory landscape because it's non-existent. Like we're talking mainframe uh, legacy core banking providers, which have been there for you know, 50 plus years. And we're, it, this is a, a very disruptive model. So we're looking to form uh, partnerships and get the blessing. And we ourselves are structuring ourselves as a, a socially responsible company, aligning with their mission uh, to try to deliver value and deliver on the mission. So anyway, that's kind of uh, in a nutshell, hopefully answering your question. No, that's terrific. And the FFE, FFE, FFIEC, right? Right. Right. Um, so I've heard that in a lot of places, what has to happen is that you have to get an independent audit from somebody who says, I've looked at this technology stack. It does certain things. It has certain reliability. They're able to follow their control processes within the bank for compliance, for risk, 
uh, and this auditor signs off on it, and that report then becomes something that the bank can use with with the regulator. Right. Do I do I have that right? You do, and typically though, it's uh, and this is it's sort of dependent on the scale. Like that type of audit typically happens with the bigger bank banks where the risk is higher. The smaller banks typically don't have that. They, as uh, somebody pointed out before, they typically don't have an IT department. Uh, and so it's incumbent upon the uh, core banking providers to solve any technology related problems. And so it's a, a question of scale uh, when it comes to regulators and technology. So um, I know we're getting uh, we're getting into sort of the last five minutes or so, and it's gone so quickly. I'm so surprised. Yeah. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Please go ahead and put them in here. But I mean, I think we're still very eager to keep talking. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things that uh, at Finerac we're trying to do is make it so our architecture encourages people to contribute back um, yes. their improvements. And uh, and so what I, what I wanna understand, you know, at an architectural level, are there things that we could do with the project that would make it easier to contribute back because I think it's super interesting what everybody's working on now. Um, so maybe Rupesh or or, or uh, Luisa, uh, if you guys want to comment on that, I I would love to see um, Binarax in a position where there's a marketplace for plugins um, for people to try and give it a go in the sandbox environment, um, and then contract with those entities that provide that directly in a very simple in a very simple fashion. I know that you know it's a bit of a, a you know, utopian view of of, um, of of systems, but you know it'd be fabulous to see you know here's five or ten different front ends for your uh, mobile for your mobile access client, here's two or three different front you know back ends to, to see your data, here's a reporting pack. Um, people can kind of pick and choose and configure the bits that they want. Um, and then, with the aid of some some you know, some serious consultancies, they can then use use that consultant the consultancy to say, look, out of all these plugins you've got, these are this is kind of what matches your way you are now. So for me, that that would be the the um, utopian um, end goal. Louisa. Well, I think that I'm going with Rupesh there. Um, I think that having a sandbox for other innovators to try to see how, I mean, the capabilities of Interact, it will be great. But again, I actually don't have a tech um, background, so I don't want to get that much deeper into <laughs> architecture mode. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. Um, Art, you're just at the beginning, but um, you know, maybe uh, you could sort of identify in your journey thus far what's been the challenges in getting on board with Finerac or Finerac CN? Yeah, the, I think we we struggled and and uh, Raman's on this call, who's like our chief architect, he might chime in as well. We struggled with sort of signal versus noise in terms of uh, documentation and uh, valuable information. And so we poured over quite a bit uh, before we were able to hone in on uh, what's really there and what's really valuable and where we should focus our energies. Um, and, and I think that was maybe the biggest challenge. I think we've made progress, but it was kind of a pendulum process where we went back and forth and then narrowed in uh, on what we believe to be true. Right, right. Okay, interesting. We want to probably follow up on that with your team a bit more. I think our onboarding processes and the documentation we have on our websites and there's various places you go to for information and what's authoritative, what's deprecated, those kind of things. I think the community is aware of some of those issues, but I, I definitely take it um, take it as a, a area of improvement. So Javier has a question. How do you manage the complexities on credit union, um, the governance of credit unions? How do you convince a board uh, and a management team to move to a new platform. What's that? What's that sales pitch? And uh, what's that thing? Now, uh, boy, we got people at different parts of this. So I kind of want to start with Art with his brand new. He's going out to market now. How does he think this is going to go? 
Yeah, I, I feel like I, so I have a, a really close friend. She's been selling to credit unions for a long time. She sells web marketing and sort of like the funnel uh, analytics. How do you get people, how do you turn up the volume on loan applications? And that's kind of the unique problem that she tries to solve. And she's talked about three personas, the chief marketing officer, the COO and the CEO. And it depends on culture. She says, basically the culture of the organization sort of speaks to whether people are yeah, they're, they're just hanging on for retirement or they they know they have to innovate. <laughs> Uh, and and, and uh, that's the reality. So it may sound like uh, brutal, but like that's how that that's how she figures out where to, where to spend her energy. Um, I think Louisa talked earlier about like working with really small organizations. They don't even understand technology, so they they sort of like they rely solely upon their current provider. Uh, and so it's like maybe you target uh, organizations that are at the right scale who. Uh, it's kind of like they're 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 the aggregator themselves. Like they know they're going to right here in Richmond, Virginia Credit Union just purchased um, a Chesterfield Credit Union, and the same thing. You know, the big fish came and gobbled the little fish, uh, and they achieved some scale by just getting uh, getting loans on the books and deposits. But the the big fish needs the technology. That that acquisition may keep them afloat for a year or two, but they still need the leverage that the fintechs and the big banks have. Uh, and so anyway, hope, hopefully Javier, that's, uh, that addresses your question. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, Rupesh, why don't you comment on this as well? Since it sounds like you just went through this fairly recently. Um, for me, it's more about, I always get back to customer experience as, as my, as my standpoint and the experience of the agents and, and say, well, where are they now in, in their journey? Where would I like to go? And then, and that's the gap, you know, to, what can we do to bridge that gap? And nine times out of 10, you'd say like, you know, a more, a more open platform, a more um, agile platform, a more, more resilient platform in most cases, um, is usually a, a, a very good solution. And then you kind of work backwards from in, in, in a consultative fashion from, from there. And that's how I approach it. So I don't really need to sell it. I, I kind of get them to sell, sell themselves. And I, I can see you're very adept at that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Louisa, I'd like to have you maybe comment on what's your funnel like, if you don't mind, if you can share that information. Do you, you go out to 100 different credit unions? Do you go to conferences? Do you pitch to thousands of people and hope that you're going to get one hit? Or like, how's your targeting? What's that effort like? Well, I think it is a mixture of everything. Um, and again, it's it's. I think that uh, the financial cooperative movement all around the world is kind of the same. And I think that that's why um, Javier is asking this question. So I think that um, in terms of your conversion pa uh, funnel, it depends a lot on what you are focusing on, the kind of financial institution, where they are, who are they serving, which are their products. Uh, but basically, yeah, the first thing that you need is to understand the market. I think that is like the first thing that you need to do. You need to do a lot of research, but like a lot of research, because this, at least from my experience, this involves a lot of um, culture things, a lot of psychological things. It's, it's actually at the end of the day um, to try to build a lot of emotional um, intelligence around these financial institutions. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have a teammate at Coelab that says that I have a PhD in cooperative psychology. Um, but I think that is like the first step. You need to know your market and you need to know how this segment works. And then the second thing that you need to do is yes, exactly, pitch to a thousand people and maybe you can get a meeting with one of them. Um, and when you get that meeting, probably you're going to have only one opportunity to convince them. And probably you will have only the first five minutes of that meeting to say something uh, to hook them. Um, and that's when the real dance starts. And in my experience, what happens is that you have probably three different stages or even three gaps amongst the, these organizations. Uh, probably the, your first pitch is going to be with the management, with the leadership team of uh, the institution and maybe they reply to your email or your phone call because they are polite or maybe because you showed up at the right time or 
whatever, but they are giving you that meeting. So again, probably you will have five minutes only to hook them up. Um, and probably you're going to convince them and they're going to realize how their operations can improve with that. But then you will have your first um, main mountain to climb, which is to convince um, their uh, board of directors. And the problem with these financial co-ops is that the board of directors are actually members of the institution because these are cooperatives. So if the leadership of a trade union probably don't know nothing about technology, imagine a member. Um, and those are the people that you need to convince that the first thing that they are going to think is that you are way too expensive. And that is the only thing that they are going to reason. It is too expensive. It doesn't matter what. And if you overcome and you actually convince them, then your third mountain will be the employees, actually, of, of the co-op. Because they've been doing the same thing for 20 years, maybe. And they know that it doesn't work that well. And they know that they have a lot of headaches with that. But it works. So what is it for me to actually change to a new mindset, to a new operations, um, to deliver this? So it is, it is a race against yourself, the other vendors, and even inside. So there's a lot of em emotional work to do and a lot of cultural work to do. Um, and so I think that I didn't answer uh, Javier's question, but at least I could share <laughs> my experience. Um, so I want to acknowledge that Raman has asked a question there about what version. Um, I think actually there's several panels that have talked about this, um, and so we'll we'll come back to you, Raman, and, and your team to talk about that and forward those things on to you. But for this panel, we're, we're reaching the end here, end here. And so I wanted just to try to get a few more final comments. Um, if you were to, you know, so this sounds like it's not uh, uh, something easy to do. Um, tell us maybe a little bit more about why you, think it is important to do and what your each of you would like to have you sort of reflect on why is this important to you where do you hope to be in three years with uh, the use of Finerac and um, and try to keep it within let's say 30 seconds or so all right who's ready all right I'm just gonna call on <laughs> art go ahead art all right I'm ready uh, yeah I'm really interested uh a friend of mine uh, runs a nonprofit up in Maryland. It's equity. It's called Equity for HC. Uh, it's about uh, impact at the uh, local level. And so it's not too different from like, I was born in Kenya, so I understand developing economies. And it's really about empowering people. That's what motivates me. And I love the fact that I can take something that I used uh, uh, with the big banks and actually bring it down to a grassroots level. Uh, I love the challenge. Awesome. Rupesh? Um, for me, I think Binarak democratizes the core banking solution so that anyone anywhere can actually run it in a, in a very sensible and, and a safe manner. Um, you know, the efforts that Arthur and Louisa are making, you know, by putting these, these really amazing wraps around them only shows as, as, as to how powerful this, this particular solution is. So for me going forward, more, more democratization, more people contributing, you know, and actually growing that solution, so it stands proudly next to any of the biggest global banking systems that, that are around. No, I, I love that, and I look forward to working with you on that. Louisa, you get the, you get the nearly last word here. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, I think that for me, it's a little bit of what Rupesh and Arthur say. Um, Way back when, when I started working in financial inclusion and, and in technology for financial inclusion, my vision back then, and it's still now, is how we can impact the most vulnerable people out there, how we can um, make a little bit of justice and, and make this world more equal. And I am 100% convinced that financial inclusion is, is, the key, is one of the key pillars towards social inclusion. And um, with FINER Act, we have the opportunity to really impact people's lives and actually maybe to accomplish to what Mohammed Yunus once said that he was aiming to reach in 2030 to a world with zero poverty. And I think that we are um, not on the verge because I think that we are 
far from that, but I think that every day we are working towards that. And I think that is where this community is going to take us. And, and I'm glad um, that I get the chance to be uh, part of this community where I know that uh, many of us, if not all of us are working towards the same um, objective and the same mission. So um, use technology for good. Awesome. That was a great ending to this. So I'm just going to say mic drop. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> I love it. Talk to you guys Bye. soon. Bye. Thank you so much. Uh, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.